Okay. Um, this is an informal gathering, but I want to formally introduce Isabel Bündchen, who is a professor of art and art history at what is now called uh, Constructor University, uh, previously Jacobs University in Berlin. Um, she taught before that at the California Institute of Technology, Scripps College, UCLA, and is basically a world-renowned specialist in avant-garde visual art and other stuff. Um, her specialties include um, uh, lots of work on the Bauhaus, uh, lots of expressions and um, women uh, uh, artists as well, um, and um, abstraction. And uh, lo and behold, that is the topic of the talk today. So, Isabel, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Sasha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will be visual since I'm an art historian, and I guess I picked a topic which is pretty large, as you could already see from the abstract. Obviously, I'm not going to uh, talk for hours, uh, so I basically picked a few uh, issues I want to explore, and uh, I said it's the politics of abstraction, also in the process of writing. Uh, the paper I saw it's actually also a lot of the promises of abstraction and but I'm interested in kind of what has been in terms of political messages being attached to basically an art form which claims to be rather, rather pure art altogether. And yeah, I guess I, I will read to a certain degree because English is not my native language, uh, but of course I will also have some interaction. So looking back at the 20th century, abstract art uh, seems to have been one of the most dominating and viable art forms, and that's another kind of nice thing to have. You can actually look back at the 20th century. That's something I was always looking forward to from the 21st century, to look back at the 20th century and maybe not break it down into the first half and then the Second World War and then the second half. Uh, so that's something which I uh, like to keep in mind, and I guess we're slowly approaching uh, this stage where we can actually do it. Yeah, just to show a few examples here, we have uh, Kandinsky's composition number four from 1911, Malevich's Black Square from 1915, Laszlo Morley Notch's A2 from 1924, Jackson Pollock's number one from 1948, and Margot Coast's number 12 from 1951. So essentially, basically already covering 50 years or half a century just in terms of uh, the range and the looks they are created. This fundamentally new artistic practice and visual experience <coughs> of modernism emerged at the beginning of the 20th century in Central and Eastern Europe and reached its peak in the art political debates of the Cold War. So now we have kind of a frame. A closer look at abstraction in modern European and American art, however, reveals that it was also a highly contested artistic expression which served various artistic agendas and political ideologies. Many artists who worked in this style found themselves rather on a defensive, no matter if in Nazi Germany, in Paris of the 1930s, in the United States of the 1940s and 50s, or in the Eastern Bloc between 1949 and 1989. Abstraction has inspired, provoked, enraged, and shaped our visual world for almost 100 years now. And other students have approached abstract art from various perspectives and interpreted it in numerous ways. Historically, the emergence of abstract art has been linked to Romanticism and Impressionism, as well as the Jugendstil and Art Nouveau design. So we have a range of theories in this respect. Theories, as well as practitioners, devoted considerable time and effort to devising complex strategies intended to ratify its existence as a valid art form in general, and in particular as one endowed with expressive powers capable of evoking alternative levels of reality and consciousness. In recent years, however, the search for a general principle in the interpretation of abstract has been more or less abandoned. Instead, the emphasis has been on the immediate historical context in which abstract works of art were being produced. In the 21st century, the engagement of contemporary artists with digital visualization practices and the use of new digital media for art projects has sparked new investigations into the forms and functions of abstraction and the interpretation of abstract patterns. And that's of course a new quality with digital media and then basically certain pattern creations which are basically algorithms. Uh, and then I will not talk much about it, but I will kind of close with this and also that we have the two sides on the one side, um, artists 
using those techniques and on the other hand saying this kind of dealing with those panels which have a sort of visual quality uh, which then basically become artifacts in themselves. In the context of modernist art theory, I'm interested in the different theoretical interpretation of political ideologies that abstract art has served. In my presentation today, I will look at the arguments and strategies having been used to explain that abstract art, or better non-objective art, is far superior to other art forms in terms of its creative potential, educational impact, and spiritual value to humanity. Central to my study is the examinations of those um, notions, and I guess it's two times four, the belief that abstract art is capable of reflecting a metaphysical truth and advancing the cosmic evolution of, of humanity, the focus on the psychophysiology of the perception of color, form, and sound, and questions about the nature of human creativity, the conviction that free creative activity forms the basis for progressive education, and the perception that it can be seen as a direct reflection of the zeitgeist serving to promote scientific discovery, technological advancement, and social progress. And there you see already a lot of promise which is put into this. And you also see that, of course, some are linked with each other. So if one is interested in the laws or something, one can teach it. And so there's a certain kind of interlinkage, of course. I will furthermore look at its use as an agent of cultural diplomacy during the Cold War for propagating democracy and American values in the post-war West, Western Europe and South America. Its role as a cultural, cultural and alternative artistic strategy in the Eastern Bloc during a period in which socialist realism was the only officially accepted art form, so again, two which are basically closely linked with each other. The concept of abstract art as a universal visual language being based on various anthropological, psychological, and aesthetic considerations, and its transformation into the digital realm and relations uh, to new methods of data visualization in the life sciences and beyond. As I said, I mean, this is basically each can be a book by itself, so that's not what I'm going to do here, uh, but I want to look at, at some specific issues which are mostly kind of in this kind of larger ideological. By analyzing the aesthetic, cultural, socio-economic, and political factors that have shaped the appreciation of abstract art in its various manifestations within European and American modernism, the focus is on the one hand on the interaction between the immediate phenomenal structure of the works themselves and the cultural conditions of their creation, and on the other hand on the investigations of form of representation and patterns of perception. And of course, basically the one side to cre creation by the artist, and of course the other one is a large field is the reception. And you see that a lot of uh, things happen in this kind of process. Let's get back to some images. I'm particularly interested in the role and the place of abstract art within modernism and the relationship between modernist art theory and theories of abstraction. And one of the central questions of my project is, how is it possible that one art form can serve so many diverse and even contradictory purposes? On the one hand, an intellectual art form cultivated by men is a tendency to systematically explore the elements of art and devise complex theoretical contexts. On the other hand, an art form that speaks directly to the human senses and can be used to introduce children and the youth to the art of the tomorrow. And also an art form that has been used for political activism and to induce social, cultural, and societal change, versus an art form that stands for individual freedom of artistic expression and also for elitism, cosmopolitanism, and decadence. So we'll have all a whole range of issues which seem to be all tucked onto the same uh, form of expression. I guess before I come to the first part, I'll just a little uh, uh, something on the conceptual approaches and terminology. <clears throat> what we term today as abstract art has not only many faces in terms of visual expression, but also comes with a number of diverse narratives. One of the most fundamental issues being if the artist arrives at abstraction through gradually abstracting from the visual appearance of nature, as is the, in the case of uh, Kandinsky and Mondrian or if he arises at it through creating forms and shapes that seem to not have an immediate pendant in nature, 
like in the case of Malevich, who proclaimed in his 1950 manifesto from Cubism and Futurism to Suprematism, <coughs> this new painterly realism, and I quote, objects have vanished like smoke to attain the new artistic culture, art advances towards creation as an end in itself and towards domination over the forms of nature. So Malevich built his works of the suprematist elements, which are basically all rectangular shapes, which are then uh, recombined again. And Hans Arp also conceived Arp neither as a copy nor as an imitation of nature. When he formulated his concerns as an artist, and I quote again, we don't want to imitate nature. We don't want to depict. We want to educate. We want to form how the plant forms its fruit and not to depict it. We want to educate directly and not indirectly. So the artist emulates nature, he educates with the design elements imminent to the visual arts and follows the laws and processes of the creative process. <clears throat> Julian Apollinaire spoke of pure painting when he defined the early abstract paintings of Vachy Turm to Orphism, uh, which was the work of Francesca Kupka and Robert Delamay in the 1912 Salon de la Section du Or as, and I quote, the art of painting new structures with elements which have not been borrowed from the visual sphere, but have been created entirely by the artist himself. This is pure art. And it's interesting that this concept of pure, everyone, I think, can, can agree on pure, but we don't speak about pure art, we speak about abstract or non-objective art, but everyone looks at the statement, so that's, that it's pure something which everyone kind of agrees more than if it is abstract or uh, non-objective. In their 1920 Realist Manifesto, Nam Gabo and Anton Pevsner proclaimed, and I quote, the realization of our perceptions of the world in the forms of space and time is the only aim of our pictorial and plastic art. And Theo van Doesburg formulated in his 1930 Manifesto concrete art, and then we had another term, concrete art, that's also something which art promoted. Um, a work of art must be entirely conceived and shaped by the mind before its execution. It shall not receive anything of nature's sensualities or sentimentalities from the data. And art essentially uh, complements this by stating that works of art are structures made of line surfaces, shapes, colors, and seek the infinite beyond the human to reach eternity. Hilda Reber, an abstract artist herself and the driving force behind the founding of the Salomon Abuchenheim Museum in New York, went a step further when she promoted and held the concept of non-objectivity, and she was extremely fixed on non-objectivity, um, to be above all other artistic forms of expression, from academic art to impressionism and expressionism, as well as cubism and abstraction. And she writes, all these isms derive the inspiration from an objective start. Development from academic painting to abstraction of objects leads to the visionary art, non-objectivity. The non-objective picture stands by itself as entirely free creation conceived out of the intuitive enjoyment of space. It is the visual essence of rhythmic balance in form, design, and color. The non-objective picture is far superior to all others in its influential potentiality, educational power, and spiritual value, which is, of course, quite a claim. And, of course, here we also have the question of superiority, which is really something which is, is, is a serious problem within modernism and definitely with abstraction, because it's always perceived as everything leads towards it. That's, that's the highest form, uh, because it is so universal and so uh, specific. Okay, then I guess I'll start come to the first point. Terminology is closely tied up with abstraction as an alternative approach to capturing reality. The early pioneers of abstract art, Kandinsky, Kupka, Malevich, and Mondrian, shared the belief that art should not serve to the production of visible reality, but be an expression of the absolute. They viewed art, and particularly the abstract approach, as a medium to advance human creative evolution and lead the way into a new age of spiritual renewal. Fascinated by esoteric ideas, occultism, and theosophy, they focused on metaphysical questions 
non-Western and so-called uh, primitive art forms, and, and syncretic approach to the study of the world's religions. And of course, there's also this hope that art replaces basically religion, which after Nietzsche got his death, uh, that basically has to fill a vacuum. This interest in, in, in mysticism and the occult as an answer to material thought and reductionist science of the late 19th century ran parallel to the search for spirituality in art. Artists such as Frank Bush, Kupka, and Mondrian believed that they were able to see into and beyond the natural world and thereby gain an understanding of the cosmic principles of human existence. They felt themselves to be messengers between two worlds and communicating this knowledge became the objective of their art. Kandinsky's 1912 treatise über das Geistliche in der Kunst on a Spiritual Art greatly influenced the production of and discourse on abstract art in Germany, Central and Eastern Europe, Scandinavia and the United States. The studies on early abstraction have above all looked at the artist's interest in mysticism, occultism and particularly theosophy. Sixth Ringwood's groundbreaking 1970 study, The Sounding Cosmos promoted a focus on the spiritual, mystical and occult dimensions of abstract art and led to a number of studies exploring the esoteric and occult rules and metaphysical concerns of early abstraction in great detail. So that's a whole body where I also won't go into much further. Manitou is kind of the first promise, essentially, to be able to dive into. Beyond their metaphysical explorations, artists such as Kandinsky and Kuka shared an interest in the conditions of the creative process and the psychophysiology of the perception of color, form, and sound. Both delved into theories on sensory perception of color, form, and sound in contemporary physiology and psychology, including Gustav Theodor Fechner's Psychophysics, Wilhelm Wundt's Psychophysiological Parallelism, and Ernst Mach's Analysis of Sensations. Kupka saw the work of art as an organism arising from the process of creation, a process that is conditioned by the subjective and objective factors. The creative process, he wrote, requires the involvement of all the human senses, indeed, the whole body, in a union of psychophysiological processes and chemical reactions. And that's very interesting that now the metaphysics kind of hook up with the sciences to a certain degree, coordinated by the human brain. The work of authors embodies a constant dialogue between intuition and reason, and between intellect and instinct. Thereby, it is intuition that is the actual driving force of the creative process. In order for the work of art to address the viewer's senses, as well as their intellect, the artist must particularly concentrate on the interrelationship between his vision and the artistic means by which to convey it. And that brings a new kind of dimension in, because the artistic means are becoming very important, because they are essentially the tools to reach the goal. Kandinsky characterized the artist as the, hand by which, as the hand which, by touching the various keys, causes the human soul to respond to certain vibrations. And there, of course, you see very much kind of the psychophysiology uh, being used as an explanation. The creative process begins as a resonance within the soul of the artist, an inner sound that is then expressed as a feeling or thought, leading to an appropriate artistic representation by means of the artist's perception, a process that fulfills the transition from objective uh, to non-objective art. The question of adequate artistic means occupied an important place in the writings of Kandinsky and Kupka. Both agreed that in analogy to music, the painter had to cultivate the very own means of painting. Kandinsky, who subscribed to the idea of a general bus, uh, describe color and line as the artistic elements that constitute, and I quote, the essential, eternal, unchanging language of painting. Kupka, in his treatise Creation in the Plastic Art, dealt not only with the sense and feeling for color, but also with a multitude of painterly elements and effects, as well as the space and its boundaries, the planes of the surface, the effects of light and atmosphere, and virtual qualities such as rhythm, cadence, and movement. 
The steel artist placed universal principles of design above individual artistic style. They are passed towards abstraction as realized in neoplasticism meant a severe reduction to the elementary design means, straight lines according to the rectangular principle of the horizontal and vertical, and the primary colors yellow, red, blue, and non-colors white, green, and black. And Malevich built his works of supermatic elements which were simple and similar in shape and served as fundamental building blocks of a new world. Reducing all forms to zero and then rebuilding the world when the Malevich suprematist forms were basic elements of a specific energetic potential, their power lay in their unlimited potential of their combinations and variations. The return to the roots of the visual arts that is the basic elements of painting and the psychophysiology of their perception connected the endeavor of abstract art with contemporary efforts in reform pedagogic through art reform, art education reforms. An aspect that has been largely neglected in modernist art theory, with I guess the exception is the Bauhaus. Even if the 1919 Bauhaus manifesto stated that and I quote, art rises above all methods and cannot be taught. It proposed at the same time a thorough training in the crafts as an indispensable basis for all artistic production. So I guess that basically, if one has the basic laws, one can teach them, and then something from this arises again. It is uh, very essential to the argumentation. Many of the practitioners of abstract art taught at modernist art schools, such as the Bauhaus in Weimar and Dessau, the Volkwang Schule in Essen, the Fulte Masi Fultein in Moscow, or Black Martin College in North Carolina, and devised complex programs to systematically study the basic laws of color and form and the principles of design. And the Bauhaus books are, of course, a good example, but one can look at other examples as well. One of those model curricula was the preliminary course at the Weimar Bauhaus, which was developed by Johannes Itten, first and foremost, to liberate the student's creative potential. The main objective of the course were to unleash the student's creative power and thereby their artistic talents, to enable them to make an informed choice of craft specialty and then essentially be able to pick the right workshop in which they are continuing, uh, to convey to them the fundamental principles of design, is the laws of color and form. Exploring a broad range of materials, and material studies is very essential to uh, the, the preliminary course, and your thesis also that the workshops are organized around materials, uh, meant that the students were encouraged to feel the material, to learn to understand its immediate nature, to free themselves from the injustices imposed by traditional uses, and to rediscover the elementary laws of perception. Bauhaus graduates such as Joseph Albus and Ludwig Hirschner Mack were strong believers in the role of artistic creativity in progressive education and would eventually bring Bauhaus principles of art education, specifically the practice of material studies, to the United States and Australia. And this whole idea that art is essential for education and that it's basically integrated in reform education uh, is basically has a revival at this time. Both were convinced that all young people, not only those with special talents, would benefit from an art education. These are art instruction not as, in, as a system of imparting rules, styles, or techniques, but to liberate the creative powers which lie dormant in every child, as Joshua Mark maintained, leading them to greater awareness of what they were seeing and doing, to open eyes, as Albus described his approach. For Joshua Mark, the main aim of material studies was, and I quote, to arouse any average boy who will not become a professional artist or architect the latent appreciation and understanding of the art of the industrial age in which we are living. In 1954, he summarized their effort as follows. I feel our art education ought to visualize the needs of the present and of the com coming generations. Our future demands human beings who have the logical and truthfully working brain of an engineer and at the same time develop the soul and the mind of an artist. And so we try to bring those sides together, even though it hasn't necessarily happened in the educational system. In a similar way, the artists and promoters of abstract art 
Kassel Dreyer, Galke Scheier and Hilary Hoiberg developed their unique art educational and outreach activities to further the appreciation and understanding of modern art, specifically abstract and non-objective art for a broader American public. And now really kind of not art schools, but basically the general public. Also, she had the fundamental belief in the spiritual dimension of art and its life-giving force, and we are convinced that abstract art had the power to touch the human soul directly and to impart a deeper understanding of the world. In an effort to make modern art accessible to a broad spectrum of the population and to influence future generations, and that's very important to have to reach the young people, because the older I get, hopeless, they won't like it. But the young people, if you convince them now, that's the future. And, and they all three go away the size of new houses. Yeah. In an effort to make modern art accessible to a broad spectrum of the population and to influence future generations, they developed a broad range of art educational and outreach activities, including exhibition, lectures, publications, and the lending of artworks to schools, universities, clubs, and other public institutions. Addressing the role of art education, Dreyer concluded in 1925, and I quote, it is very important that art should be brought to all classes and that we should develop in our country a genuine love which does not end in attending lectures, but ends in the desire to own pictures. Shaya, who set out to promote the art of the Blue Four in the United States, specifically focused on nurturing an enthusiasm of modern art among young people, teaching art classes and lecturing on free imaginative and creative work with children, underlining the importance of art for the mental and psychological development of children, and emphasizing creative activities as a means for artistic self-expression and individual self-liberation. In their commitment to modern art, the artistic intentions of these three women artists and art educators were closely associated with their social and educational activism. The interval period saw a secularization of the spiritual concerns of early abstraction. Individual artists, as well as art institutions, including, for example, the Bauhaus, turned to science and technology and the ideas of modern industrial production, leading eventually to the emergence of the movement of constructivism. Abstract art became a trademark of the modernist zeitgeist, taking into account the experience of modern life in a world that was characterized by urbanization and industrialization, rapid social changes, advances in science and technology, new modes of transportation and forms of global communication. It represented an art which belongs to our 20th century and not to the Renaissance or even the Impressionists, so this idea that this is really up to date and um, yeah, the most adequate expression of, of the modern experience. The ex extensive literature that deals with this focus on science and technology, industrial production and an urban lifestyle has shaped our understanding of modernism well into the present. So that's something which is very typical that we basically always look constructivist as the one side, also there is a much broader range. Constructivists saw themselves as part of a large international network promoting modernism and specifically abstract art, a new universal language that would lead to a new social consciousness, improve society, and change the world. This idea was first enhanced by the constructivist desire to transform art into designs for everyday life, many of its representatives working in fields such as typography, advertising, product and interior design, and architecture. However, they believe that abstract art would serve as a universal visual language accessible to all, regardless of nationality or culture, and shape the desire, design of an egalitarian society, governed by mutual exploration and an international spirit, remained a short and unrealized utopia. The utopian dimension of the scientific approach to the interpretation of abstract art is also evident in the evolutionary model that Alfred H. Bohr used in his chart of the development of modernist art. As the founding director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and one of the main promoters of abstract art, or was drawn to this art form for its absolute physiological honesty and its insistence on the absolute. In particular, valued the purity of style, the originality of invention, and the influence of the artist within an international matrix. And this is a kind of 
uh, dimensions which are very much um, in the theory. The diagram traces the unfolding of modernist art chronologically, nationally, and stylistically from the 1890s to the present, indicating an inevitable teleological progression towards abstraction. So that's kind of interesting to see that this like abstraction is where everything leads to. And of course, we still have uh, the other placing out a polar opposition between intellect and intuition, technology and nature, the geometric and the organic. This is systematic perspective that resemble a scientific approach and relieve formal analysis of any interpretive responsibility or had a lasting impact on art history writing and art criticism well into the 1960s. He not only paved the way for Clement Greenberg's formalist theory, but also for the arguments by which abstract art was to be used in the cultural balance of the Cold War. With the rise of fascism in Italy and Germany, the establishment of the doctrine of socialist realism in the Soviet Union, and the growing dominance of regionalism and American scene painting in the United States in the 1930s, abstract art became the subject of heated political and ideological debates. It was denounced as leftist and degenerate in Germany, decadent and bourgeois in the Soviet Union, and foreign and communist in the United States. The ideological debates gained new momentum after the end of the Second World War, facing a Soviet cultural offensive in the Eastern Bloc during the heights of the Cold War. U.S. officials did recognize the merit of cultural diplomacy and the role that art could play in advocating American values abroad. They began gradually to stage abstract art, particularly abstract expressionism, as a weapon against communism. This promotion of abstract painting as an expression of the free world was based on a reinterpretation of the concept of the avant-garde as evidenced in Clement Greenberg's formalist art theory. Also, many members of the historic avant-garde between 1910 and 1925 had considered themselves to be socially critical and or politically engaged. Their work was now being reinterpreted as purely artistic revolt concerned first and foremost with formal innovations. By the mid-1950s, a full-scale cultural battle between the United States and the Soviet Union was underway, and the debate on abstraction versus realism in art became one of its centerpieces. But in the United States and Western Europe, particularly West Germany, abstraction was championed as a sign of artistic freedom and zero democracy. It was condemned as being formalist in the sign of artistic decay associated with American cultural imperialism in the Soviet Union and, the East, and Eastern Europe, and here in particular East Germany. And so basically now we see that something gets turned on, and I, what I find always interesting is that the Americans didn't like abstraction at all. It kind of happened more in the process that suddenly it became very useful as a, as a cultural tool uh, in terms of uh, diplomacy. And I guess this place, particularly out in Germany, being divided and, and basically having to live between the East and the West going through. And so we find this also in the post-war German art. In West Germany, the promotion of abstract painting was a welcome approach to leave the Nazi past behind and demonstrate the country's reintegration into the Western world. In the atmosphere of the economic miracle of the 1950s, or looked artistically back to classical modernism, particularly Bauhaus, and oriented oneself at the same time on the school of Paris and abstract expressionism. In abstract art, it was argued, the artist had freed himself from the object, no longer simply reproducing re reality, but creating freely instead. Artistic expression, revealing social or political commitment, humanist or religious belief, were frowned upon, and any form of realism in art was characterized as ideological tainted in the sign of lack of artistic freedom. And this kind of basically having this apolitical abstract art was also something to get really rid of the Nazi past. So I mean, we have art historians who were there in the SS or something, but promoted after the war abstract art, and it was only brought out basically at the end of the 20s, in the 21st century, that they had this past. So this was really something which was seen as, as basically being apolitical and never having had to do anything with history. 
Western discussions about abstract art in the post forget centered above all on the freedom of the individual in the creative design process and in the reinterpretation of art. In his opening speech of the 1955 documenta, Jana Haftmann maintained, and I quote, modern art is essentially local art, art for the individual, and serves to meet people's awareness of their uniqueness and irretrievable being, which is human dignity. This exhibition is by individuals made and sort of for each and every one of you as individuals, so now also the perception is individual. By giving up the intention of wanting to shape society, the artists of the postmodernism left the field to others. Abstract art could just become a medium for the messages brought to it from the outside. In this respect, it is not surprising that it became increasingly charged with political and ideological content. On the other side, in Eastern Germany and the Eastern Bloc, which was under the dominance of the Soviet Union after 1945. Socialist realism became the only officially accepted art form, also this is, of course, um, there is a variation across the, the countries and cultures. According to this doctrine, art had to be relevant and accessible to the working masses and supportive of the aims of the state and the Communist Party. The focus was on realist depictions of the everyday life of the working people with an optimistic outlook. Artists who did not adhere to the prescribed program of socialist realism did not form a unified group, and I guess it's very important that it is really uh, it's a broad, uh, broad band uh, of people in working individually. But they united by their belief in the freedom of individual creative artistic expression. Their so called non conformist art was not necessarily forbidden, as long as it was kept private, but then it was shown publicly the creators were often subjected to reprisal or persecution. So as non-conformist artists were forced to work in solitude and without official recognition, they developed alternative networks and became representative of an alternative or underground culture, acquiring by default a political stance and subversive meaning. And that's also interesting because, I mean, even if they didn't do political art already because of the circumstances, it was that political. Um, so that's essentially the other side of the medal. Due to the efforts of art critics such as Clement Greenberg and Howard Rosenberg, and art historians such as Werner Hoffmann and Werner Hofmann, abstract art began to gain mainstream acceptance in the 1950s. While European abstract artists were becoming engaged with existentialist philosophy, the abstract expressionists who held that the authenticity of a work of art lay in its directness and immediacy of expression often turned to ancient use and archaic cultures for inspiration and also explored Jungian psychology. For action painters such as Jackson Pollock, Wim de Kooning and Franz Klein, the gesture of signature of the artist resulted from the actual process of the book's creation. For the colorful painters, including Mark Rothko, Barnett Newman, Cliff Still, Clifford Still, the expressive potential of color was essential. The vast scale of the African expressionist groups greatly contributed to their meaning. The viewer was virtually enveloped by the experience of confronting the work of art. And that's, of course, also a big part of the, the size uh, of the reception and the effect, essentially. At the end of the decade, Arnold Gale saw the expression of true freedom only in abstract painting, and according to Werner Haftmann in his 1954 book, uh, Malerei in 20. Jahrhundert, many in the 20th century, abstraction had taken on a global character and established itself as a universal art form. This concept of abstract art as a universal visual language, which was based on various anthropological, psychological, and aesthetic considerations is, for example, reflected in Willy Baumeister's influential book, Das Unbekannte in der Kunst, The Unknown in Art, in which the artist postulates a parallel between the creative process in nature and the process of artistic creation, and maintains that the abstract artist, using elements from archaic and non-Western cultures, refers in his work to a common cultural <coughs> heritage of humanity. So essentially everything is, is in there. 
Baumeister described the process of artistic creation as the artist surrendering to, and I quote, the means of expression because that is all he has to come to a concretization and materialization. He enters a sphere in which these artists, artistic means alone speak and share, shape the work. And that's a very interesting kind of observation with him that he essentially says, oh, the artist has a starting point, some vision or some idea, and then basically in the process he has to give up and essentially uh, let the, the means speak through whatever comes out. The ideas that abstract art had developed into a universal art form of a global character found its most pronounced expression in a 1958 publication, Abstracte Kunst, eine Weltsprache. So abstract art and world language by Georg Ponsken and Leopold Sahn. The book opened with the statement, and I quote, abstract art is a movement that has spread so extensively that it can only be compared to that great revolution called the Renaissance. Okay, that's, I guess it's probably the pinnacle of the reception of abstractions of the late 50s. A critical examination of the listed artists, artistic movements, and their geographical distribution, however, uh, is surprising because the global aspect of abstract art is not evident at all. It is rather exclusively presented as a Western phenomenon in art, which, appear, which apart from North America doesn't go beyond the European continent. And there again we have this question of superiority kind of implicitly um, included again in their own publications. Also such as Hoffmann, Hoffmann, Pönskin and Zahn, Related in the abstract item, individual self-expression with universal claims, at a time when their thought was governed by the unbroken belief that the world was moving in inevitable towards democratic conditions, scientific technical progress, and secularization. An abstract painting was the adequate artistic expression of these modern realities. This appropriate abstract art to see the artistic and cultural superiority of the Western world over the rest of the world. By emphasizing the universal character of abstraction as a form of artistic expression, they also implied that abstraction would become the dominant art form in the rest of the world in a foreseeable future, since it was then an expression of a universal development towards modernity and progress. The various art movements of the 1960s and 1970s, including conceptual art, op art, kinetic art, color field painting, nuclear abstraction, fluxus, minimalism, and post minimalism, took abstract art beyond the medium of painting and opened up a wide range of new artistic possibilities. However, with the end of the era of modernism in the 1970s, abstract art lost its actuality and appeal, and of course, this immediate connection to that it is painting. <coughs> In his text, Die abstrakte Kunst und das Leben, Abstract Art and Life, Bernard Leger concluded with astonishing foresight, and I quote, At least I believe that this tendency, meaning abstract art, has given everything what it could give. Creatively speaking, it seems to me that it has reached a dead end. It is ruled by what, what desire for total accomplishment and liberation from which saints, heroes, and fools are. It is an extreme state in which only a few creators and their admirers can sustain themselves. The danger of this doctrine lies precisely in its elevation. So looking at things up to here, um, I mean, we really have like, this kind of three major op opposites. So one is essentially the universal reality, uh, uh, contradicting the uh, individual, or basically they are one goes in, into the other and back and forth. The second one, the intellectual versus the emotional, so does it need explanation or is it self-explanatory or just kind of gets experience? And then of course social political commitment versus apolitical and apolitical aesthetic expression. For the artists of the interval period, art was a medium that transcends the individual and foresees uh, focus on shaping a new reality. They saw themselves as avant-garde in the true sense of the world and their creation as blueprints for a new modern society. The painters of the post of post-war modernism, on the other hand, withdrew to the position of the individual, and as Baumeister explained in his vision, they slow, slow, slowly but surely lost their visions in the course of the artistic creative process. 
While the pioneers of abstract art, Kandinsky, Kupka, Mondrian, and Malevich, were primarily concerned with their participation in the mysteries of life, creating cosmic consciousness, and experiencing the formative laws of the universe, the abstract artists of post war modernism focused above all on the autonomy of the artistic means and the autonomy of art. By drawing their inspiration from the diverse repertoire of other cultures and past epochs, they believed that they placed their work in a universal overall art historical context. But by reducing the content and goal of the artistic creation slowly, uh, solely to the subjective effects of the artistic means, abstract painting lost its universal dimension and its life-shaping function. Abstract painting increasingly became the medium for the subjective processing of the existentialist world experience of the individual artist, the effect of which was limited to the subjective reception of the individual recipient. It was just able to capture and reflect the zeitgeist, but hardly reveal any new design possibilities. And if we speak about the intellectual and the emotional, then of course we always have those artists who produced uh, abstract paintings, but of course also the vice major books. Uh, and of course, there is no surprise that we have the constructivists with the high manifestos, we have uh, Mondrian and Dösbrook engaging in major discussions, we have of course Kandinsky producing a lot of books. So we have basically, the history of modernism is full of men who produce uh, major series. Uh, and what always gets lost in the process is that actually there is a lot of female artists who produce uh, great art, uh, but of course, this is kind of more on the side, or only comes in here and there. Right? So we have this very heavy kind of focus on explaining everything and make it more important by explaining this. So that's a really kind of important, um, um, essentially, fa factor in this whole modernist story. And of course, the third one is also kind of, yeah, basically along the political divide. So on the one hand, uh, art really using art in terms of changing society and, and being involved in changes or basically saying, you know, this is an individual position and it's up to everyone and of course I can only do what I, what I can basically see or experience. So yeah, so I think those things we can take up in a discussion because, I mean, this is really essentially uh, the course between it is um, developing. I want to, in terms of concluding, make a few comments still on visual abstraction in um, the time of the digital age, and also very briefly. In the more recent times, that is the late 20th century and the early 21st century, the use of digital media by artists and in parallel with the application of new methods of data visualization in the life sciences, medical research, statistics, and nanotechnology has moved the modern analog concept language and method of visual abstraction into the digital realm. And of course now we also are faced with this uh, problem of how do we read images. So essentially there's a lot large data data sets produced and also in terms of medical research kind of yeah, what's the outcome of essentially if we do this. And that has been really uh, posed a major problem and feels one also needs people who are capable of reading images. Uh, these basically still being undecided what kind of images this are. The engagement of contemporary artists with scientific visualization practices, ranging from an iconological handling of scientific images and the use of new digital media for art projects executed directly in a laboratory, has sparked investigations into the complex role of digital visual representation in relation to forms and functions of abstraction and the interpretation of abstract patterns in both fields. The growth in digital native information visualization has led to a larger and greater use of techniques of abstraction to dynamically visualize large data sets to better navigate the complexities of life and knowledge processing. Such visualizations are meanwhile recognized not only as products of knowledge product producing technology, but also as expressions of art and design and as cultural artifacts. And that's interesting that basically now it comes from both sides. Also, I guess the, the thing in between is very neutral because it's basically a visual expression of algorithms. Because of the changing technology as well as the desire to articulate the visual, many aspects of visual culture now overlap with the study of science and technology, including hybrid electronic media, 
cognitive science, neurology, and image theory. This transdisciplinary perspective makes possible the study of new visual techniques arising at the interface of computer science and the visual arts. It explores how scientists are developing new specific visualization techniques and how artists are applying them to aesthetic concerns in the creative process. I will stop here. Thank you very much.